Alright, so for the past two years, the issue of sexism in video games has been one of the most controversial topics discussed by various gaming news sites. We've seen literally myriads of articles spinning the exact same story. Video games are inherently sexist, there is a noticeable lack of compelling female characters, gamers are a bunch of misogynistic neckbeards trying to keep women from joining their elite boys club, and so on and so forth. And while there's a certain level of veracity to some of these claims, given some of the events that have transpired in the past couple of months, one has to wonder if some of said articles weren't simply an attempt to propel a certain agenda. After all, when you have hundreds of women voicing their disagreement and disgust with all of these hashtag messiahs and their social justice rhetoric, only to be belittled and labeled as male sock puppets by the likes of Rebecca Watson, can you really argue that these people have women's best interests in mind? Like I said, for the past two years we've heard plenty of show rhetoric based on nothing but feels when it comes to this rather controversial subject. But what do the facts say? In the first video of this trilogy, we made mention of the book The Proteus Paradox by Nick E and published by Yale Press. Nick E is formerly a researcher at Palo Alto Research Center and currently a researcher at Ubisoft. And he's best known for his work at Stanford University on the Daedalus Project. The Daedalus Project was a study of how gamers bring real-world politics, superstitions, and practices into the blank slate of gaming. Feedback was collected for various topics by a diverse array of volunteer gamers. In Chapter 6 of The Proteus Paradox, Nikki provides data and testimony that the gaming landscape, while still a male-dominated locker room utopia, is just some of the symptoms of a larger social issue outside of gaming, and not the cause. To quote Nick Yee, Our offline politics don't change when we enter the virtual worlds. It's also about how things beyond our control end up altering how we think and behave. The example that we cited is when male gamers playing with female avatars experience sexism firsthand and use it as a learning opportunity for their real-life conduct. Additionally, according to the research in the book, the superficial controversies of how women are portrayed in games, the arguments which most hashtag messiahs have built their fame and careers around, are actually not one of the biggest reasons why women aren't picking up the controllers. So what's really keeping women out of gaming? Well, according to the research conducted by Nick Yee, one of the biggest detriments to gaming becoming a socially acceptable pastime for both sexes is the pervasive stigma that women who like video games are either posers or, quote-unquote, Filthy casuals. For example, one of the testimonies from female gamers that Nick Yee cites in his book involves a woman going to a game store to procure the latest hot AAA release. And once she brings the game to the register to ring it up, the cashier at the store casually greets her by asking, So, who are you getting this game for? Your boyfriend? And unfortunately, the same real-world mentality often ends up leaking into the virtual world of video games. For example, if you play MMO games and you decide to use a female avatar and devote your real-life sex in like a chat room or something, there's a pretty good chance that some players might demand that you prove the legitimacy of your gender. <laughs> Show me your tits! Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> There's also the perception that like, if you're in like a raiding party and it's being led by a character and you find out that the character is actually a female gamer, you start to dismiss her input because there's this social belief that most women are casual gamers and not mm. hardcore gamers. Yeah, but of course it's like, how do you define uh, who's a casual gamer and who's a hardcore gamer in the first yes. place? What is the exactly. definition of a gamer, period? I've never considered myself as a female gamer because I have no idea what my gender has to do with my gaming. Growing up, girls played video games, guys played video games, and it was rare to actually find two people together who actually enjoy playing video games because not very many people were really into it back then. Back in the day, if you were a gamer, you were considered like a nerd. Right. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't nearly as socially acceptable as it is today, at least for guys. I can win in one try. You can? Well, come on. No way. What do I look like, a nerd or something? Don't I should tell my mother what we do in here at night? What, that you play video games and I fall asleep unfulfilled? Yeah, there was a whole other stigma attached to it, let alone, you know, what gender yeah, you were. Yeah. But now that it's popular, gender has to become an issue. Yes. Well, especially in 2012 when the Entertainment Software Association concluded that 47% of gamers are women. But let me ask you this, though. What is a gamer? According to this statistic, 53% of gamers are male, alright? But tell me, do all 53% of these male gamers play 
all the different types of video games and genres that are available out there. Exactly. Exactly. And I would say the same goes for the 47% of females. It's like, which are we talking here who play what kind of games, you know? Mm -hmm. Especially because gaming, uh, thanks to tablets and, and smartphones, mobile devices, yeah, it's, it's boomed. I mean, gaming has changed so much in the last decade alone. Are we really, at this stage, going to sit down and talk about how this has been a long-term problem since, like, I don't know, they, they talk about it as if... The NES days. Yeah, they, they talk about the NES days as if they started in 350 BC, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the fact that they talk about gamers as if it's this whole contingent, the fact that they talk about women as if it's this whole... It's this one thing. It's not a hundred of in individual people, you know? Right. No one looks at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Exactly. And we do acknowledge the fact that there are certain social stigmas attached to women, like, you know, women only play The Sims, or they only play, like, uh, those Facebook games, like... Uh, Farmville? Right. It's the hunter-gatherer dichotomy trickling into gaming, and as though all men prefer adrenaline-pumping FPSs, while all women prefer games where they're more apt to multitask and manage resources. It's a bit stereotypical. I mean, you heard what, uh, what's all going on over at Ubisoft, right? They basically came out and said they were refusing to make a female as the main protagonist of the next game. And people just went all up in arms about it, you know, and they're all like making all these little web comics, making fun of them, saying that the folks at Ubisoft aren't capable of making a woman walk or anything like that because it's too much work. It was funny though, because I saw this post the other day on Tumblr that there were actually assassin females in one of the games. Yes, in a PS Vita game that they made. Yeah, a female protagonist. Yeah, but hardly any of these fans have ever brought her back up. Yeah, that's true. The problem with that is that, first of all, we have to assume that we need Ubisoft to sell more of its product to women, right? Yeah. Which I don't think we need to do because Assassin's Creed is very mediocre. And the <laughs> only reason it's popular is because it had a massive marketing push. Some women are acting as though they've been betrayed, but but companies don't owe them anything. We treat companies as if they're people, but they're not. They're, they're, they're industries designed to make money. Women would have to come out and say, I'm here, I want your game, with their wallets to show them that there's a problem and that they need to change this to have more women but i guess what they got out of all of this was that our market clearly doesn't reflect that so we haven't done it in the case of assassin's creed though are women not going to play the game just because it doesn't feature a female protagonist am i not going to play tomb raider because there's no male protagonist that's right. that's insane yeah, exactly yes <laughs> what was really interesting was that when ubisoft uh told them that we think it's too complex we're not going to put in a female character the, the day afterwards sunset overdrive very cleverly revealed that it also had a female character that you could choose and everybody went well done and she even looks like an Assassin's Creed character with the white hoodie and stuff but, um, <laughs> but, but what I was thinking was does this not suggest that the that actually we don't have a problem because the market is responding it's survival of the fittest you know right because obviously the market will respond to consumer demands and if there's enough if there's a big enough problem like you have an X-Blades game where the woman's running around with a thong and you know enough people are incensed about it and they're not buying the game then the, the companies will shift direction however I wonder if causing a shitstorm on Tumblr isn't kind of like blackmailing a company. Uh, it kinda is, because here's the thing. As far as female characters go, Nikki does acknowledge the fact that 85% of all video game characters happen to be male. And while it might seem like 15% is a dangerous little number as far as female representation goes, I'd argue that it's more of a quality versus quantity thing. Exactly. Because think of how many memorable and complex female characters we've had just in the past decade alone. Meanwhile, as far as the 85% of male characters go, try naming those that don't fall into one of several hackneyed archetypes that we see over and over again. Yeah, they all basically look the same. Yeah. You guys have to consider that the sex of the character has very little to do with how good the game is. Yes, it's all about the writing. Exactly, yes. And again, it's this whole thing of, well, we want to see Ubisoft do better female characters, and it's like, go and play what Double Fine are doing, go and play Sunset Overdrive. All these people who are not only doing, you know, the natural thing of we're bringing females into games, but they're making better games, which is what's important. Here's some interesting bit of trivia for you. Even though Chapter 6 of Nikki's book does have ample testimonies from women expressing their disconcertment with over-sexualized female MMO avatars, I also remember there being several quotes that suggest that some women wouldn't mind the more sexualized female characters, as long as the male avatars also have a bulge where it counts. You know, to level the playing field. And this got me thinking. 
How come if you're playing as a burly alpha male type, it's a power fantasy, but if you're playing as an attractive female, then all of a sudden it's objectification? After all, if both men and women don't mind the other gender flaunting what they've got, can you really hold it against those characters? I mean, how come, say, Chan Li, despite being one of the world's top martial arts masters, is written off as show eye candy based on her looks, but Ryu isn't? I mean, are we seriously meant to lose all respect and reverence for the girl just because she shows a little bit of skin? Because here's the harsh truth, people. Both men and women want to look their best at all times, even when playing in a virtual world. Because it's all about empowerment. I mean, honestly, tell me, in an epic fantasy RPG game, would you rather play as a ruggedly handsome hero of the land who slays the dragon and saves the princess at the end, or as some fat and ugly peasant? <laughs> Bob the Stable Boy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, precisely, Bob the Stable Boy, whose entire life basically boils down to him shoveling shit all day. Who wants yeah. to play as that? The sad reality is, is that sex sells. Yeah. You look at a cover of like X Blades, for instance, and it's, it's there to get people to buy it just because there is a uh, minority people who buy it just for the TNA because obviously it wasn't for the fucking gameplay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but people are attracted to certain people and certain attributes, and that is what will help sell some products. For instance, Street Fighter 4 came out, and Street Fighter has always been largely hyper muscular masculine men versus you know, Chung Lee and Cammy White. I mean, you know, very, 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 very sexy women. It's it, very sexy men, very sexy women. And uh, even E Honda, uh, the sumo, to an extent, was very, very muscular. And all of a sudden, in Street Fighter 4, they bring out a character named Rufus, who is this very jiggly, very obese character. And people are like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> it's because video games are escapism, and people want to escape as something better. They want, they want yes. to play as the sexy Nathan Drake type character. They want to stare at, you know, Cammy White's butt. You know, I mean, it's... <laughs> this is just human nature. Well, I, I think while, in a sense... Or they even want to... Hold on, hold on a second. While I do agree... <laughs> he still got a point. While I do agree that women and male characters should be equally represented, if male characters and NPCs are going to have a bulge in the front, then how come women don't have camel toes? <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with the escapism. I don't know that that's completely down to ideals. I mean, I play a very eclectic mix of games, and when I play stuff like uh, Conker's Bad Fur Day and... Um, right, I'm, I'm not saying that applies to all kinds of games, of course. Yeah, exactly. Like, when you play Pikmin and stuff like that, it's not really that you want to be those characters. It's more that you kind of want to... It's almost like you're helping those characters, you know? That you you've had a hand in taking part in this weird, wacky thing that's happening. Godlike presence. It's still escapism, though, so I, th I think that totally ties into the point. Yeah. If these over-sexualized characters and their, you know, revealing costumes are so horrible, then how come a lot of women will dress like Chung Li at, like, conventions? Yeah. Yes. Don't they find some empowerment in being the character? Yeah, I've heard a lot of women say that they find it really good for self-confidence, and, and trust me, women and men both go through physical issues of self-confidence, and mm -hmm. there's nothing yes, wrong with a yes woman. Yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you hear my voice. Uh... No, no, I've been there as well. Yeah, so there's everybody a, there's, has. Yeah. But, that, but that's the thing, it's like, I don't think some people have quite grasped onto the fact that women who look after themselves tend to look like a certain type, and there is nothing wrong with that person wanting to flaunt what they've got, wanting to say, look, I'm really really happy with the way I look and I I think I can pull off the way this character looks as well you know and, and I don't find that people say oh my god you know I want to have sex with well, a raper straight away I find that people say wow that's a really nice job doesn't that person look just like the person in the in the game or the cartoon or whatever you know yeah great cosplay that's all yeah exactly the reason I ask is because when it comes to strong, confident, sexy female characters in gaming, there's quite a split with a feminist vote. And in the case of the intentionally hypersexualized character Bayonetta, one feminist's embodiment of female empowerment is another feminist's oppressed fuck toy worthy of sex shaming. And sex shaming, sadly, is an all too familiar experience with some female cosplayers. It's an age-old thing that leads on from that, which is this whole thing of the human condition of not wanting to look bad, yes. not yes. wanting to lose face. Everybody wants to be able to say, oh, look what a good person I am. And as a result, they pour money in, you know, or support certain views or outwardly say, I am this or that. And nobody wants to say that there's certain things as well, you know, because again, they don't want to lose face. You wear a fedora, well, you use Tumblr, you're a YouTuber, well, you're a feminist, well, you're a man, well, you're a woman. Yeah. It all comes down to 
bigotry versus bigotry. All of the philosophical discussion that's supposed to be happening here is not happening because people want to cash in on how can I make myself look better. The feminist Christina Hoff Summers, who some people don't feel should be called a feminist because she advocates for both men and women's rights, they asked her, you know, what do you think the situation is? She says in this quote, Call it a generational swindle. Even the best and brightest amongst the 20-somethings have been shortchanged. Instead of great books, they wasted a lot of time with third-rate political tracks and courses with titles like Women Writers of the Oklahoma Panhandle. Instead of spending their college years debating and challenging received ideas, they had to cope with speech codes and identity politics. College-educated young women in the US are arguably the most fortunate people in history, yet many of them have drunk deeply from the gender-feminist Kool-Aid. Girls at Yale, Harvard, and Swarthmore see themselves as oppressed. That is madness and madness can only last so long wow yeah and she absolutely hits the nail on the head this is how we've gotten to this stage this is how we've gotten to this kindergarten level of debate over how things should look you know yeah and none of us are discussing the actual issue of the improvement of art of the improvement of the craft of the improvement of education intelligence and skill levels exactly there are absolutely no priorities in this debate yeah Look, there's no denying that all of this nonsense began roughly two years ago with Anita Sarkeesian announcing her Tropes vs. Women Kickstarter campaign. And you know what? All drama aside, I suspect that the reason so many people decided to financially support her series is because they genuinely want to see the medium of video games improve. However, I would wager that the vast majority of said people expected Anita to focus her videos on issues that both men and women can agree are real problems that need to be fixed. Instead, so far it's been anything but, from highly subjective personal interpretations to downright misinformation. Look, you wanna see more women embrace gaming? We wanna see more women embrace gaming. But in order for that to happen, we need to find some middle ground here, or at the very least base our arguments on facts. Because otherwise, if you're gonna reach a conclusion first and then scramble to find anecdotal evidence to corroborate what your gut tells you, then no wonder you're seeing sexism everywhere. You can persuade more people to your line of thinking through rational debate and presenting the facts, but skewing the data, talking down to us, insulting us, trying to shame us, and trying to silence us into accepting your way of thinking will not make us drink your Kool-Aid. To paraphrase a great article by Reason Magazine, the backlash by gamers towards these radical feminist ideals is not anti-woman discrimination. It's anti-authoritarian rebellion. Swing on your brother.